This is Red Hot Healthcare. Interviews with today's leaders and all the news that matters. Here's your host, Steve Ambrose. Hello and great to have you aboard. I'm your host, Dr. Steve Ambrose. For past and upcoming episodes, find us on iTunes and most podcast directories or on our eye-catching website, redhothealthcare.com. Paul Matson joined Cleveland Clinic in 2006. As their chief marketing officer, he's responsible for all marketing and communication programs at Cleveland Clinic, including global development of the brand, marketing of key clinical lines of service, regional and international locations, and digital marketing. He also leads Cleveland Clinic's corporate communications department. Prior to joining Cleveland Clinic, Mr. Matson was most recently the Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Delta Airlines. He began his career in New York, working at a number of leading advertising agencies, including Gray and & Young and Rubicam. He's a graduate of Rutgers University. And Paul, I want to welcome you to Red Hot Healthcare, and it's great to have you aboard. It's great to be with you, Steve. We're going to dive right into this, and I know the audience is going to have just a really enjoyable time listening to you. Uh, Let's start first, if we could, Paul, with your background. You started off on the retail side of marketing. You worked for Delta Airlines as their chief marketing officer. Fill us in a little bit on how you felt like that experience provided some advantage coming into the world of healthcare. I found that virtually all of my marketing skills my core marketing skills, understanding consumers, developing brands, understanding and using digital acquisition strategies, those things translated well into the healthcare space. But the most difficult thing for me was actually learning all of the complexities of healthcare, uh, learning how to work in a medical culture, learning about payers and providers, uh, learning about the role of insurance and reimbursement. It was it's a very, very complex industry, and I think a difficult one for people to come to from outside. Uh, I'd worked in a number of consumer categories. I worked on telecommunications, fast food, financial services, travel, and healthcare by far is the most complex industry. Yeah, that's for sure. I know that you came on as chief marketing officer in 2006. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, Paul, was certainly because you had a a different background in marketing, in branding, but in a whole different uh, set of sectors. What were some of the problems and challenges that right off the bat, when you looked at Cleveland or when you came in, you noted and needed to be changed? One of the first things I noticed was while we had an excellent brand, the Cleveland Clinic brand was, was already strong when I arrived, but in many ways it was very fragmented. And that's an issue I see across healthcare, where health systems have different names for institutes, departments. They have different branding on their regional hospitals and outpatient centers. And one of the first things we had to address was unifying the brand across the system. If you think about other consumer categories, most consumer brands and services rely on a master brand strategy. And we strongly believe in that here. And we've moved uh, towards that over my tenure. And then that was reflected in a lot of our marketing platforms. For example, our website was extremely fragmented as you moved from page to page, department to department. It was a different experience. The navigation wasn't consistent. The look and feel wasn't consistent. The tools weren't consistent. And that's not a very good experience for patients who are trying to navigate. So uh, really unifying the brand and how we presented ourselves in the marketplace, what we stood for, and then starting with building the right digital platform first on the internet was really one of the first things I had to address. Yeah. And you know, when you look at the major systems today, when you look at uh, Hopkins or, you know, Mayo, those were built really before the internet even came out for decades before. And yet, you know, I heard about Cleveland, I knew about Cleveland, but it seems like that Cleveland appeared to catch up to them in terms of popularity. Uh, from the changes that were made, you know, when the internet came around and the strategy you took theirs, is that a fair statement? We've, we've certainly our brand has grown dramatically in the last ten to fifteen years, and we've become now a nationally recognized brand. I think Hopkins and Mayo have been on the national scene much longer, 
Uh, we still have some room to, to further close that gap, but we've made tremendous progress. And it's for us, it's been an integrated approach. I always like to talk about our approach is integrated with owned media. We view ourselves now as a digital publisher. So what we do on the web and in social media and content, earned media, we've been very, very successful in placing our CEO and our medical experts and caregivers in the media. Uh, and that's an incredible asset for healthcare providers, especially nonprofits. Uh, and then I think we've been very smart and highly targeted in how we use advertising and paid media. So it's been a, a very effective mix of those three things that have helped us advance the brand. Earlier this year, we met at Hims. Uh, you gave a talk. I believe it was sponsored by Philips. One of the things that you really stressed was the rising of healthcare consumerism. And that's something that I like to write about. I like to uh, have it quite a bit on the podcast. And I see this is changing, uh, especially now that more money is coming out of individuals' pockets in terms of first dollars for healthcare, for healthcare coverage, and and certainly for, for drugs. I'd like to get your take, if I could, Paul, on just the changes that you've seen in the last 10 years leading to uh, what you and I would probably both uh, say is a real rise in, in healthcare consumerism. I think people in the healthcare industry still underestimate how much consumers are taking responsibility and control of their own healthcare decision-making. Yeah. The best evidence of that for me is uh, some research that suggests that 80% of patients when they're diagnosed with a disease or condition go online to search for information. And they typically will do 19 to 20 searches. And I know he, he, when, a, when patients come here to the Cleveland Clinic, they often come with a file folder with the physician's bio printed out. They might have printed out articles and publications they've written. They probably will bring information from other websites that they've searched. They'll look at their physician ratings. Patients are taking responsibility for their own health care, first and foremost, by looking for trusted information and content and engaging in more intentional conversations with caregivers than previous generations. You know, beyond that, obviously, as people have high deductible plans um, and more is coming out of their own pocket, they will shop for right. things like lab tests and imaging, for use of express care and walk-in clinics. And we're, we're beginning to see the very rapid rise of virtual visits as well. And that's something at the Cleveland Clinic we're embracing and uh, being an early mover on. So I think there are many dimensions of consumerism that we're seeing take hold. And I guess one last I would mention is also consumers are being very thoughtful about their choice of insurance plans, which often in involve choosing a narrow network. In, in many respects, a brand decision, a healthcare decision, because you're really locking yourself into a choice for a year. It's happening in many ways. You know, there's just not a lot to choose from on the health plan side. I mean, this is what's happening is, is you know, just personally, I'll just share it with the audience and with you, and I'm sure my listeners already know the way I feel about this, but I'm not a big fan of the payers. I mean, they're there. They serve a purpose. Uh, I know they certainly have to exist. But one of the things that I see changing with consumerism, uh, Paul, is not just the individuals, but now what you're seeing too is you're seeing the the companies that in many cases purchase health insurance. Um, you see like Walmart is actually in certain cases circumventing around the payers. They're going right to the local health systems or the centers of excellence, and they're innovating, they're shopping, they're looking at their, you know, their health costs completely different than they had maybe five years ago. So I just think when it, we're talking about consumerism, um, you know, we're not just talking about individuals, but we're really talking about those maybe self-insured companies that, that purchase care. I happened to be on a panel recently with one of the leaders of Walmart's health benefits program, and we are part of their program for heart care. And she made it very clear that they want to have their associates have the opportunity to go where they can get the best quality care which means the best value to get the best, right, the most appropriate care, the right care done the first time. And, uh, and so they're looking for partners across the country to be part of their centers of excellence program. I also think you're seeing a blurring of the payer provider space. You see, of course, Kaiser Permanente, you know, highly integrated. You see it with organizations like UPMC. You see it with organizations like United Healthcare that has its own network of physicians that provide virtual care and other types of care. So right. there's definitely a blurring of payers and providers 
We've entered into several insurance partnerships, one with uh, Humana for Medicare Advantage, one with Oscar Health. Uh, that's a very innovative new program that includes uh, concierge type services and virtual uh, services provided through Oscar and Cleveland Clinic. So I think you're going to continue to see lots of innovation in that space as the market shakes out towards better consumer-oriented solutions and hopefully higher quality care that keeps patients healthy. And now, a message from our host. Red Hot Healthcare was a side hustle that started for me back in January 2017. I'm pleased to have had tens of thousands of downloads and show listeners who are some of the top healthcare leaders and influencers. However, my full-time career focuses on adding tremendous value for healthcare organizations. I'm happiest when filling the needs of those I work for and with. You can learn more by visiting my consulting page at redhothealthcare.com forward slash consulting, or reach out to me directly by emailing steve at redhothealthcare.com. And now, back to the show. You know, one of the problems, I think, in healthcare is it, it seems to be on its own island when you talk about the entire healthcare sector being a whole different animal, especially from where you came from in, in true consumer markets, where there's real competition, where there's real pricing being driven down over time and quality going up. And now what I see is that value-based care coming down the road, but it seems like there's a lot of talk about having pricing transparency. And I want to get into this with you because I know we've talked about this off air. You're a big believer, Cleveland's a big believer in pricing and quality transparency. And I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. And then maybe if you can address to what degree does Cleveland also consider affordability in its services? So maybe I'll take the affordability piece first. We're working very hard across the entire Cleveland Clinic organization to keep our care affordable. And we've actually taken out over $800 million in costs going back to 2013. And it has been hundreds of uh, steps that we've taken to make the organization more efficient, take out wasteful costs. And that's an ongoing process for us. It's something that takes continued focus and a long-term commitment to keep our care affordable. And, and that's, as I mentioned, something we've been working on now for many years. As it relates to transparency, we absolutely are committed to transparency. We were the first organization under Dr. Cosgrove's leadership to require all of our clinical institutes to uh, produce an annual outcomes report mm -hmm. uh, that we would publish uh, in print at that time. And they would distribute to all the members of their uh, area of specialty. Um, and that's something that's been going on for over a decade. Our goal in the future is to migrate those quality reports, outcomes, those outcomes reports online in a way that the data uh, can be put in a usable database and searchable instead of in a text and PDF form. So that's, that's really where we think the future is going there. Uh, additionally, of course, we embraced physician ratings. All of our physicians um, who see patients and have more than 30 visits, their HCAPs and CGCAP scores are presented on our website with all the domain comments. And uh, that's proven to be very, very successful. Uh, it's well received by consumers. It also helps how we display and our physicians display in Google search. So, uh, you know, I do think over time, transparency will continue to grow in different ways. Uh, pricing is complex today because people have different health plans, have different copays. So while, you know, our charge master pricing is on our website, I don't think today that's as useful to consumers as what ultimately people would like to see. Yeah. But then there's also, you know, areas like I, I mentioned, we have uh, express care virtual visits. We also have 20 walking clinics, and those are opportunities where if, say, someone's out of network, those can be paid for on a flat rate, $49 uh, for a visit, much like a CVS minute clinic visit. So to me, that's another form of consumerism and price transparency as well. Yeah, I agree. I, I really think that providers are a lot more powerful moving forward. They have a lot more leverage than the payers do. I personally see this as a tremendous expansion possibility for providers. Uh, you know, talking about telehealth, talking about, you know, purchasing uh, urgent care centers. You spoke about even payers starting to get into the provider side. I know that I just got off of a, uh, my last interview was with Mitch Morris. I don't know if you know Mitch. He's the executive vice president of Optum Insight. 
And Optum, they're buying urgent care centers, they're buying surgical centers, they're buying, uh, you know, all different clinics. It seems like they're sort of hedging their bets as well. Well, as I say, I think you're going to see uh, many different forms of partnership. You're going to see people experimenting with different strategies and methods of access. We're already seeing good early success in our uh, digital access programs, virtual visits, e-visits, distance health. And we certainly believe that a digital transformation of care is going to come to healthcare beyond the digital marketing things that we do today. Let's jump back into your marketing, and particularly the way Cleveland looks at playing off of its brand. I, I, I believe I read somewhere where locally, where the brand's already established, you're looking at sort of positioning yourself to reach people to talk about convenience. In those areas that you're not in yet, that's where you're first starting to get into your branding and, and being more well-known. Maybe you can talk about that just on a geographic basis, how you look at sort of segmenting out the different facets of your marketing. There's a duality to our brand in the sense that here in Northeast Ohio, the 21 counties that surround our home market of Cleveland, we're very fortunate we have 100% brand awareness and we track our preference for all major service lines. And we're preferred in every major service line that we offer, sometimes in multiples as high as 7 to 1, 5 to 1, 3 to 1 over our competitors. So that's a very enviable position to be in from a brand perspective. So what we focus our local marketing on is not awareness, but really communicating new programs uh, to consumers. Over the last five years, we've been focused on different dimensions of access. We had focused our communications a number of years ago on a very innovative program called Same Day Appointments, and we were the first healthcare system to do that comprehensively. We now do over a million same day appointments a year. Mm. We then moved to walk-in clinics. We now have 20 walk-in clinics that are open Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Saturday and Sunday, 8 to 4. They've been tremendously successful. And now we're focusing on access anytime, anywhere through virtual visits. Yep. So our local focus, uh, trying to um, give patients new forms of access, make it easier for them to interact with us, taking down any barriers there are to them using our health system. And that's been very, very successful. And at, and at the same time, we've also tried to make our system approachable as well as accessible to people in human terms by doing things like we have 1,200 physician bio videos on our website so people can get to know our care teams. Nationally is different. We're certainly one of the top brands nationally, but top of mind awareness for system healthcare systems out of people's local markets is relatively low. So we, uh, and oftentimes people don't think about traveling for healthcare until they're facing a very complex disease or condition. Yeah. So we do several things nationally. We, we have a very clear understanding demographically, psychographically, technographically of who our national patients are and where they come from. So we target very specific geographic markets uh, based on the disease or condition we may be promoting. We run 137 paid search campaigns that are geographically targeted. Um, wow. We use social media. We have, as you know, over 1.3 million followers on Twitter, 2 million Facebook followers, and we view ourselves as a digital publisher. And once you acquire a follow on social media, if you create great content, they stay with you. So we use that to engage people with our brand. 90% of our social media followers are outside of Ohio. And then we use highly targeted paid advertising, 90% uh, of which is digital with a lot of video to also build awareness. But the critical thing in marketing for patients who want to travel is to really meet them at their moment of need. When they're diagnosed yes. and they're searching, when they're diagnosed and they're searching, that's where our content needs to be available, needs to be great content, it needs to be trusted. And our brand provides a lot of lift uh, because people do have some top of mind recognition. Then we provide them great medical content. Do you have any inclinations of when, when somebody does do that search and they find your content, how many steps does it take for them once they find that content to actually connect? Is it a matter of they got to go? They have to go on your website, then from there they've got to take a few more steps, or is it somebody gets in touch with them immediately? I mean, how does that work? Depends a lot on what their diagnosis is uh, and how urgent it is. What we do is uh, when people find us on search, we uh, try to collect their contact information. 
name, email, phone number. We give them the opportunity to download a custom treatment guide on their disease or condition that's been created by Cleveland Clinic experts. And then we offer them a variety of options to contact. They can fill out an online appointment request form. They can live chat with our contact center or a nurse. Uh, they can email us for a direct follow-up uh, with questions. We recognize not everybody is going to make an immediate decision about making an appointment or traveling for care. So we try to offer many different contact strategies for them. And we find that once they engage on our website and they engage with our content, they consume almost all of it on their specific disease and condition. You know, you talk about, and I've read several of your, the articles that talk about your mindset on this. You talk about personalized digital engagement, you know, meeting them at their needs more than reactively, I should say, and waiting till they call you or contact you, which so many hospitals, health systems, and providers do now. They haven't really transitioned to that proactive, let's go find them, let's go target them, let's go engage them, and, and let's win them. Let's win their loyalty. Let's actually, you know, win them so that they, you know, feel that they're, we're meeting their needs, that we're caring for them, and they have a great experience. I just enjoy seeing that. You talk about the growth of your content marketing at Cleveland, and one of the things that I'd like to get into, you know, your blog called Health Essentials has about four and a half million visitors a month. I think it's the number one most viewed healthcare blog in, in the world. Uh, you've got 2 million Facebook likes. We talked about, I think, 1.3 million Twitter followers. Uh, you all are obviously pushing out a lot of content. Um, tell me a little bit about how you've scaled up that operation, though. I know that you started off with just a few people, but you have sort of a small army now, don't you? Well, we've done a number of things, and I, I would stress to anyone who's thinking about their social media content strategy to realize it's a journey. You're not going to start with a fully developed, perfectly executed strategy, but social media and digital platforms allow you to rapidly iterate, and we call it test and invest. When we started our social media in 2009, we had to learn and we had to talk to our consumer base and understand what content they wanted from us, what they wanted to engage with. And over time, we learned that particularly on our social platforms, Health Essentials in particular, they wanted to engage with daily health and wellness and innovation content. They weren't treatment seekers. And we could create content for them. And over time, it's evolved to include a great deal of infographics, videos. So I have a passionate belief that all marketers have to be digital. Right. And while we have a web team and we had a social team, I want everyone on my marketing and communications team to have a digital mindset and skill set. So we actually combined our traditional creative services team of writers and designers with our digital team. And that unlocked incredible talent because these writers and designers had years of knowledge writing on medical topics combined with a lot of our socially and digitally savvy team members. And that just produced, uh, you know, catalytic results for us. The other thing we did was we invested in scale. I'm not at all shy to say it's social media, folks. It's a media platform. We are a digital publisher. We aggressively pursued followers with paid tactics yep. because who can afford a content team creating daily social content if you have 10,000 followers, if you're, a health, if you're a health system. So we went for scale and it's really paid off. Yeah, but you see the difference too, Paul, and, and you know it real well. It's almost like while everybody's looking at value-based care, triple aim, we got to low, you know, we got to bend the cost curve down we, and all those things, I know they're necessary, but there's so few companies out there and they're starting to come, but there's so few provider organizations that are really taking an offensive stance. It's almost like while they're plugging the holes of the bucket, right, at the bottom of the bucket to retain patients and to retain profit and to reduce, you know, uh, unnecessary cost, they're not filling up the bucket. They're not looking at constantly bringing in, you know, qualified patients or winning over patients to, to bring them into the bucket. And I see that you all do that just so well, especially with that strategy you took about being you know, a content provider where you're not waiting for them to, to reach out and say, yeah, I want an appointment. I've decided for that. Some of these people don't want appointments. They don't want to come in. They just want to learn. And you're happy to help them on that journey. Well, you know, as I said earlier, many people can't ever imagine that they'd travel to Cleveland Clinic for care in their lives. But they're trying to engage in a healthier lifestyle. They want health and wellness content from a trusted organization. And so uh, we use our content uh, hubs 
to and our social strategy to engage with people. But when they are diagnosed with a serious disease or condition, we're then in the consideration set. And I think that's where a lot of a lot of healthcare executives and and marketers, I don't really think they fully understand the value of a brand in healthcare and that a brand can make a difference and can elevate your overall performance and your ability to attract and acquire and retain patients. And I can say here that the the clinical leadership at the Cleveland Clinic does appreciate that because they see it in their practice every day when they have patients from 180 countries in all 50 states coming in. You know, people don't have to replicate what we do. Maybe they want to expand regionally uh, within their local or broader in their local geography. It takes a, a strategic approach and, and I think using your marketing dollars and communications differently. Yeah, sort of like the tip of the spear in growth. And, you know, if it were up to me and I were looking just on the patient growth uh, side and maybe the revenue growth side, one of the things that I like is not just the marketing and the branding, but then really expanding out that virtual footprint, you know, maybe starting with the virtual visits with the telehealth. And then at some point, if they're not following through off the consult um, and there needs to be, let's say, a, a need to strategically partner or maybe even start doing some M&A work in some physical spaces in state or out of state, that's the way I see a lot of health systems needing to grow. Almost like, I don't want to say controlling patient base, but sort of winning over consumers on the healthcare side and then being able to, as you said, scale out, you know, not just virtually, but eventually sort of their physical service footprint too. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think every organization needs growth. If we're not growing, then we're primarily going to be focused on reducing costs. So growth can come through geographic expansion. It can come through new strategies for patient acquisition, as we do with search engine marketing and digital acquisition. It can come through new products like walk-in clinics or virtual visits. And we're seeing a remarkable percentage of patients coming in to walk-in clinics who are new to the clinic. We're in a very mature market. So how can that be? Well, lots of patients don't have primary care doctors or relationships. I know sometimes healthcare professionals think everybody has those established relationships, but a lot of people are willing to brand switch and uh, try different entry points into the health system. We, we've tried to meet all those segment needs. Yeah, you're meeting them at their needs. And, and one of those needs, I know I beat the drum on this, Paul, probably so much that you're sick of hearing it, but I, you know, I beat the needs on affordability. And the, the very real fact out there, and it's sort of a taboo subject with a lot of providers, they don't like to talk about pricing, they don't like to talk about affordability or lack thereof, but you've got a lot of people that, you know, they they don't want to spend five, six, seven hundred dollars to come in, you know, if they have to get a whole workup, where now they can go to an urgent care center, and perhaps that's going to serve a majority of those people, serve their needs. So instead of losing them all together because they don't engage, you know, Cleveland and other smart providers starting to recognize, hey, a need could really be affordability. And it's, you know, like you said, Paul, you can't just assume that everybody has a doctor or wants to have a doctor just because you think it's important to have a doctor. Uh, being a doctor or being a provider organization, sort of like a confirmation bias. I think, you know, we would agree that access... Uh, affordability and quality, all of those three dimensions are critical going forward to be successful. And I think we also know consumers are always evolving. And I, you know, I think that's why we've embraced uh, experimenting with and doing rapid learning in new areas like having our own express care walk-in clinics. And that's been very, very successful. And I would go back and say too, if you have the opportunity to go to a Cleveland Clinic walk-in clinic versus a perhaps more generically branded walk-in clinic or a provider who's solely in the, the walk-in outpatient space, you know, many, many consumers are going to prefer to come to Cleveland Clinic because we're known for our quality and clinical excellence as well. But we're, we're offering an, an equivalent value or better value uh, for someone who just has to come in and pay out of pocket. One of the things I read, Paul, was you remarked in an article, and I'm going to quote you here, healthcare is bought, not sold. No one ever wants to need a hospital, but if a healthcare brand can build a strong and positive relationship via social with people when they're healthy, those people are more likely to turn to them when they do need care. And I wanted to tie this into when I was back in practice, 
a message that I constantly had to remind my patients of. Just because you feel good doesn't mean you're healthy. And I think that's a message that's lost not just on the American consumer for healthcare and, and patients, but also with doctors. I think we've kind of come to a point where when people quote unquote feel good, the assumption is sort of that they are good. And, you know, you could feel good and have cancer, as you well know. Uh, in my practice in chiropractic, patients could just have a little neck pain and have, you know, three levels of degenerative joint disease in their neck that has been there for 15 years. It doesn't always equate. And I want to bring this around full circle. When you have your marketing efforts and messaging, what do you do in terms of putting that message out? You know, talking about the need to come in and get a physical or early detection, even if you feel good. Do you find that that's a marketing message that resonates or one that you can actually maybe use to pull more patients out of the mix in pre-chronic stages, maybe where they have no symptoms? I, I'm not sure we've ever approached it in exactly that way, but I would say that if you look at the content and the strategy behind the Health Essentials blog, that is really what we're trying to do. We, we address many, many taboo subjects. We address many everyday health concerns. We try to address those questions that people might be uh, asking themselves when they're lying in bed at one o'clock in the morning, not able to sleep. Mm. We run the full gamut of questions from sexual health to very basic questions like, what's better, an elliptical or a treadmill for exercise, uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen? We have a kind of a famous infographic, at least in our world, we did a few years ago. It's the most viewed infographic we ever did. It's called The Color of P. And the real headline talks about what the color of your urine says about your health. But these are questions that consumers want answered and don't necessarily want to pick up the phone and ask their physician. But one of the interesting things with Health Essentials is when we started, it, it was really a landing page for our social content. And almost all the traffic came from our Twitter and Facebook feeds. Today, the content's been so successful that it shows up extremely well in Google search because it's the type of content people are searching for. And we now get more organic traffic from search to health essentials than we do through our social pages. So we are trying to address those everyday health questions that the kind of the worried well are always asking themselves. Paul, speak to us a little bit about consumer behavior and the psychology that you use within your marketing. And I've had this conversation before with lots of different provider leaders that they were so shocked when they put their EHR patient portal out several years ago and how low of an adoption rate was out there. It was almost like they thought, okay, we've built it. It's here. You know, patients certainly are going to want to download the records. They're going to want to check in every day and submit data to it. And it was almost like a slap across the face, like, guess what? You have the capability, you have the technology, but you really didn't understand what it takes to make your consumer or your patient take action. Tell me how you, you work that into your marketing, the uh, sort of the behavioral psychology and, and sort of getting people to take action versus just a message which might unfortunately have a lot of confirmational bias baked into it. Our experience has been that patients who use the EMR, who use my chart in our case, find it extremely valuable, especially patients who may be facing multiple conditions that they're managing and they're working with multiple providers within the health system. Uh, because, uh, you know, for them, obviously, when they come in, it, uh, all of their information is there, managing that medication list, managing the problem list, uh, being able to see the notes. And I think a critical part on the provider side, uh, and I'm not a IT expert, but it's really making sure that the care providers are populating the data, making sure the data is accurate and useful, and making sure that the data and test results are being posted in a timely manner for patients. Uh, but I will say in our research that patients who use my chart, it, it makes them very uh, connected to their healthcare provider and health system. So when used properly, it can be an incredibly valuable tool. There's no doubt about that. I'll give you an example of sort of where I'm coming from with this. So I'm connected with the chief information officer at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, uh, and she was on our show as a guest. One of the things we talked about is the fact that they have a very high patient use rate. 
I believe it's something along the lines of 85% of their patients actually not only subscribe to the portal, but I think use it once a month. And one of the things that she spoke about was the importance of culture. Uh, Just baked into the whole culture of their organization is this idea of the mother standard of care. And so this idea of the portal, it's communicated on all levels. It's like not just the doctor, Mm -hmm. it's the staff. It's, you know, the nursing uh, group that might check in once a week with the patient or once a month, almost like it's, it's weaved into the whole experience, but it's, it's a cultural sort of thing. And I guess that's sort of where I'm getting at with that question is, you know, Cleveland seems like it's not just capable in terms of the fact it's scalable, great brand, great brand name, but your culture really seems to carry something that's just honest, ethical, and and it's just very clear, I think, to, that there's a lot of training that, that goes into all of this. Well, we've been, we were one of the first uh, health systems in the country to deploy the electronic medical record broadly across the system. And we, we have a significant adoption in the market of our patients using the electronic medical record. And I think our physicians are actively involved in trying to make it better and making sure um, as I was saying, things like the probable list, timely test results, reminders for patients, appointment scheduling and follow-ups. You know, what, one of the things we're seeing is tremendous usage of the e-messaging within my chart, where patients can reach out directly to their physician or care provider with a follow-up question about their health or their treatment, uh, which can forego a future appointment or a phone call. You know, today, obviously, the platforms can be made better and, um, more user friendly, but uh, I do think you know for patients and caregivers who are you know, who have committed to the platform, it, it does provide significant benefit, and it does bind them loyally to the doctor and the health system. Yeah, see, there you go. You're just you're anchoring them in like that, and a mindset that maybe hadn't thought the entire value of the patient and putting themselves in the position of the patient might say. No, no, no. You have to come in to talk to the doctor about that. You have to make an appointment. And another reason a patient could drop off, right? I mean, another reason that a patient is going to get disconnected is you're putting, you're putting another barrier in. Right. When, today, when physicians take the time after they've put in their eight or 10 hour day, and then they go to answer all the inquiries, the messages they've gotten through my chart, it does add to uh, physician burnout and physician workload. And there is no reimbursement. For that today. But it's certainly the right thing to do. And it's a lot like doing virtual visits today. The reimbursement model hasn't caught up with the technology. Uh, at some point, it will, whether it's b- being paid for the total episode of care or being paid for the value based care model. Then these technologically based solutions begin to make a lot more sense. Maybe you've been asked this before. I'd like to think I'm the only one that's going to ever ask you this, but. Uh, Because you're so successful with the marketing and the content system you've created, and because there's so many health systems and hospitals out there uh, in areas that, at least right now, you're not going to be able to serve directly, have you ever considered offering your marketing or Cleveland's marketing and content as a paid service to capture and deliver other patients into other health systems and hospitals around the U.S.? I can't say that we've actively considered it as a business uh, for us to get into. We have a significant number of partners that we work with. So through our Heart and Vascular Institute, uh, we have a number of health systems and hospitals around the country that are affiliates of our heart program. They adopt our clinical protocols. Our physicians um, assess and help them improve their quality and outcomes. And then they're able to use our brand in their local marketing. And when someone becomes an affiliate partner of the Cleveland Clinic, we will share best marketing practices with them, and uh, they do get certain use of our brand with our approval. I will say that the challenge with that often is we've built a marketing infrastructure here at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, For example, a marketing data warehouse, marketing automation platform, significant social platforms, a highly integrated website. And to to successfully implement what we've done, you have to make sure you've put the proper structure and strategy in place to be successful. You can't just take our tactics and put them out in the market and necessarily get the same results that we do. But I'm assuming that with your branding, 
and I'm not being coy in asking this, but I'm assuming you're getting paid. I'm assuming Cleveland gets paid. It's a it's it's not a free thing to allow other partners to use your brand. Right. No, it's always tied to a clinical program. So again, in the case of the Heart and Vascular Institute, the brand comes last. The first thing is um, that there's a clinical affiliation and adoption of clinical care paths and protocols. There's quality standards and outcomes that need to be met. And once that is accomplished, uh, then the brand can be used. The affiliate logos can be used. Last question, Paul. What's one thing that you believe to be true that very few people agree with you on? One of the things I believe very strongly about marketing that I don't think many other people integrate into their actual practice is to be successful, you have to build scale behind your most successful programs. I see many people who pursue what I call check-the-box marketing. They have a responsive website. They have a Facebook page. They have a Twitter handle. They have Snapchat. They have 10,000 Twitter followers. Uh, We have 2 million. We heavily invested to get there. And to invest and get there, we had to stop doing other things. We don't print an annual report anymore. We don't do physician printed directories anymore. We don't do white pages or yellow pages anymore. And I could run further down the list. We've dramatically reduced, we don't use outdoor anymore. We, uh, we've dramatically reduced local sponsorships. In a world of tight dollars, what we've done is we've put our money in building scalable platforms, many of which are digital, because without scale, you really can't be successful. And that means making the tough choices to stop doing things that are creating less value. So I believe in scale, and I, I believe in constantly iterating and testing our way forward. But you know, as you move forward, it means also being prepared to let go of some of the things that are no longer creating value. And I think more marketers and organizations would benefit from letting go of the things that really have outlived their useful life. Paul Matson, Chief Marketing Officer for Cleveland Clinic. Paul, I want to thank you so much for being on Red Hot Healthcare. Uh, I know I've been looking forward to this for quite a long time, and I'm glad we could get it scheduled. Glad I could have you on the show, and uh, very, very uh, happy that you were able to uh, just fill us with some great insight and value. Steve, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Red Hot Healthcare with Steve Ambrose. Subscribe to us on most major podcast directories. For media or business inquiries, reach out to media at redhothealthcare.com. Thanks for listening. This is Denny Colonna. We're out of here.